Imagine a world where there's no LSAT. It's easy if you try. No, I'm not going to sing the song. But what if the LSAT became optional? Or what if it became one among several acceptable aptitude tests for law school applicants? Would you take it? Should you take it? Let's ask an LSAT expert. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dream. Welcome to the 477th episode of Mission Straight Talk. Thanks for joining me. Before we meet our guests, I'd like to highlight the featured resource for today's show. It is Acceptance Law School Admissions Quiz. Are you ready to apply to your dream law school? Are you competitive at your target programs? Acceptance Law School Admissions Quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash law dash quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment of your chances, but actionable tips on how to improve your qualifications. Plus, it's all free. Again, use the calculator at exhibit.com slash law dash quiz to obtain your complimentary assessment. Our guest today is Steve Schwartz of the LSAT blog and the LSAT Unplugged podcast and YouTube channel, which we're going to link to from the show notes at exhibit.com slash 477. Steve graduated from Columbia University in 2008. In high school and college, he had tutored students in a variety of subjects and also helped prep test takers for standardized tests, including the LSAT. However, he really began to focus on the LSAT when he was applying to law school. He founded the LSAT blog in 2008 and never looked back. Today, 14 years later, he has helped thousands master the LSAT, get into law school, and sometimes secure scholarships worth tens of thousands of dollars. Steve, thanks for coming back to Admission Straight Talk, because indeed you are a repeat guest. Thanks so much for having me on, Lynn. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Glad to have you. Now, in the last few years, law schools started accepting the GRE. Today, we're here to discuss a possible LSAT optional world. Can you give us context for something that a few years ago, I don't think either of us would have imagined possible? Yeah, sure. No, it is quite a surprise. If we look, but if we look at in general, the general trend has been for more and more of higher education to go test optional. We've seen this at a number of uh, undergraduate institutions, oh, yeah. but the the graduate level, they seem to rely quite a bit more on standardized tests. And I'll allude to this briefly now, we can get more into it. But overall, I think some of this comes from the fact that there's a lot of grade inflation in colleges and universities. And so if everyone has a high GPA, then how are schools going to distinguish between different applicants? And so I think that's part of the reason for the change. Right. No, I certainly agree with you that I think that's the change being the the focus on the test score increased because the GPA was a less valuable signal. Right. So that's that's why they they right. they say that they they might need need exams like the LSAT for admissions purposes, but at the same time there are concerns around the equity involved in members of different groups having d- different test scores and concerns over access. So these two issues, on the one hand, grade inflation, on the other hand, issues of access, they're kind of seemingly at odds with each other, exactly. And so that poses a sort of problem and a sort of debate that all of higher ed is trying to untangle. Right, right. And you've also seen really different trends. I mean, the undergrad world has really embraced test optionality. COVID, I think, forced test optionality briefly on business schools in particular, and then they voluntarily assumed it either through waivers or through by going test and totally test optional. Medical schools, a couple tried it, then, you know, but doesn't seem to be taking hold, at least not at this point there. In a variety of graduate schools, you know, either the therapies, the, you know, it's it's very mixed in, right. you know, in the non-professional sphere. And a few weeks ago, MIT University, which did embrace test optionality as a whole, suddenly the undergraduate uh, school announced that they are going to require a test once again, because they felt it actually enhanced access and equity. 
Um, obviously nobody, undergraduate or graduate in any field wants to admit people who aren't going to see, succeed. At this point in time, what do you think LSAC is going to do? And what actually is the issue? Is it schools making a choice? Is it LSAC imposing a policy? It's a fantastic a question. Yeah. So just to backpedal a little bit, you know, you mentioned COVID and how schools were going test optional. And because of the American Bar Association's requirement that law schools use a valid and reliable admission test like the LSAT, right. law schools could not do that in March 2020 when the pandemic hit North America, right? So at that point in time, they canceled the March LSAT, they canceled the April LSAT, but LSAC quickly moved the LSAT online and was able to, quote unquote, save the LSAT for that entire testing cycle and for the pandemic ever since it's been continuing to unfold over the past two plus years at this point. Now, there has been this debate about higher education going test optional in different contexts. And as you know, even in the medical school world, the equivalent institution to the ABA, I guess it's the AMA, right? Like they have gone test optional for the MCAT, yet medical schools continue to use the MCAT, right? So even though med school, is that, is that correct? correct I think wrong. only two medical schools, to my knowledge, I could be wrong on this, went test optional uh, in the 2020-2021 cycle, which was the one that was really hard hit by the, and, and by the way, the MCAT was unavailable for much longer than either the GRE, the GMAT, or the LSAT. And um, I think it was only Stanford and the University of Wisconsin. Obviously, Stanford is a very prominent program, but um, I don't think it stuck. To my knowledge, it did not stick. It was not adopted by others. They did move the cycle later because people just couldn't take the test. <laughs> That's the long and short of it. But it does not seem to be sticking in the medical school arena. So in other words, you're saying that medical schools do use the MCAT. Oh, yes. Even oh, though they are not required yes. to. Yeah. Yes. And Very heavily same, rely on yeah. it. Same for business schools, same for- Business um, schools, the, the most higher ranked business schools are still requiring the GMAT or the GRE. They're completely agnostic in terms of the test. Foreign business schools are requiring it more because they also have a, a you know, tremendous, a, a greater range of schools that they're dealing with. Um, but among the US programs, especially outside the top 20 or outside the top 15, test optionality is increasingly common usually via a waiver. Mm. Total test optionality is less common. Usually they're, they're, they're requesting a, a waiver form and they decide do we really need a test or not. Okay, so the default for those applicants is that they would submit a score. However, if they don't want to, they simply submit a waiver. And are they generally approved? It depends. Depends, okay, yeah. So. It really depends. So when the American bar, so basically the legal field is a bit slower, a bit more bureaucratic. LS, this has been true for the LSAC. This is true for the ABA. And so they're kind of the last ones to come to this test, test optional idea in terms of they've been kicking it around for a while, but finally it seems like it's actually going to go through. So this most recent recommendation by the American Bar Association's Strategic Review Committee has been to go forward and modify Standard 503, which is the rule that requires they use an exam and say, law schools, you are, of course, allowed to use an exam for your consideration of applicants, but you are not required to do so. So this is the idea it has been proposed. It has not yet been enacted. There is a period of consideration where people can submit comments and then they will review those comments. But my guess is that it's going to go through. And when it does, very little may actually change because as we're seeing in these other contexts, schools find these exams useful as a yeah. benchmark from which to evaluate different candidates given grade inflation, like we talked about. So that's the short, that's the short version, but we can go into any specific areas you'd like. So if LSAC rescinds its testing requirement, and I, I'm going to guess they will also, there's very little reason for them not to. They'll, they'll get brownie points for doing so. Um, uh, for increasing access and equity and fairness. And they're going to be giving the law schools the option of doing what they want. And there still is the bar to the bar exam that, you know, you got to pass to become a lawyer. Um, what happens then? 
Do you see law schools turning to waiver applications? Do you see programs going entirely test optional? Um, do you see more tests being acceptable? The GRE is already increasingly acceptable. Um, GMAT, um, MCAT, you know, whatever. Uh, there are some MBA programs and very good MBA programs that will take any test with a letter in, in the acronym. No, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but certainly there are those that are taking the, the LSAT, the MCAT, the GRE, the GMAT. Um, what do you see? Yeah, sure. So I do think that if the ABA goes through with this measure, which they almost certainly will, then law schools, I think the top ones will still want to see either some kind of standardized test score. They will probably prefer the LSAT. They will give it more weight. It's a more competitive pool of people taking the LSAT. And the GRE is taken by so many different people that a, a top score on the GRE isn't necessarily meaningful or relevant to law school specifically. And the LSAT is still a way to distinguish oneself as an, a law school specific applicant rather than I'm just looking to go wherever I get in for any kind of program. So I do think they will want to see some kind of exam. The LSAT has already, however, lost its monopoly. At oh, least yeah. over 80 schools take the GRE. Now, a very small percentage of, of students actually are accepted with a GRE score, but it's out there and that trend will probably increase over time. So I do see that the, I, I do expect the top schools will require some kind of exam score, but the lower tier ones that aren't really as concerned with how their students are going to do on the bar, as long as they achieve above a certain bar passage rate, they may go totally optional. The waiver is a nice compromise though. I could see the waiver happening. Right. And the waiver also, what, what I've seen happening again in the B school arena is that the people who get the waivers are the ones who have the high GPA, have the great work experience. You know, they've done a lot of writing. They basically don't need the test. And I'm, not, I'm talking now, I was in the law school context and the MBA context is probably more, they have the high grades, they have quantitative work experience, uh, quantitative coursework with A's in it. They have quantitative, you know, relevant work experience. That would be, again, they don't really need the test score to evaluate the applicant. Those are the ones who are getting the waivers. And I assume it would be, you know, equivalent group getting waivers in the law school market. Would well, it's an agree? interesting distinction though, because I mean, is the average B school applicant similar to the average law school applicant? Whereas in terms of work experience, age, I wonder if there's a difference there where the LSAT score is weighed so heavily in admissions currently, whereas in B-school admissions, perhaps the GMAT does not carry the same weight or the GRE. The GMAT or the GRE do carry a lot of weight in, in the B-school process. And I've talked to many admissions directors and even at schools where the test is optional, especially you know when, co when tests were much less available. And they were saying, you know, you. Your, your application will be evaluated without prejudice. Um, even though you don't have a test score, we're going to look at everything else. But you, ki you kind of sense, and certainly in private conversations, they missed the test score because it is an objective measure. And remember, B-school applicants, they are a different pool. And that's why when I was talking, I realized I was talking almost in a, in a law school context about MBA applicants. They're very different. Um, law school applicants, I'm going to, I'm going to use a stereotype and exaggerate it. They're not expected to know how to add, uh, you know, business school applicants are supposed to be quantitatively very, very skilled because they're going to be taking graduate and quantitatively demanding courses in business. So that's one major, uh, major difference. Um, you know, law school applicants have to be able to write, or at least they're supposed to be able to write, uh, you know. MBA applicants are supposed to be able to communicate and they definitely need to be able to write cogently, but the writing, the writing level, the research level on, on a qualitative form of research is, is definitely very different. My, my point there was though, if you can show via your transcript and your extracurricular activities, whether it's paid work or volunteer work, that you have what law schools are looking for, then they don't really need the test score to graduate from a rigorous college with a rigorous program in the areas that law schools value, do they really need the LSAT? Well, that's the question though then, because yeah. I mean, my, my thought is that a B-school applicant may have rigorous quantitative work experience. Let's say they worked 
at an investment bank or in management consulting, that's kind of hard to fake that, you know, McKinsey isn't just taking anybody, right? Right, right. However, law school applicants, they may go have gone directly from undergrad and have no work experience at all, which is quite common, or they may have worked as a paralegal or maybe in a totally unrelated field, but still, whatever they're doing is not like being a lawyer light in the same way that being a management consultant or an eye banker is still fairly close to what one might end up doing after business school as well. So I'm wondering, maybe law schools do rely upon the LSAT as an objective measure. And yes, you, they, they can evaluate your writing and your essays, but it's possible to get help from admission consultants to portray oneself in the best possible light. It may not be quite as objective a measure of one's single of one's sole abilities in quite the same way. Um, it's it's possible. I mean, I think we might be arguing or, or debating here something that isn't isn't all that important. Sure. Okay. Um, my main point was if they go with waivers, the people getting the waivers in the B school context are the ones that um don't need the test score to show they can do well in, in B school. Okay. If you look at the qualities that law schools are looking for, and, and you're right, because of the work experience element and the more significant work experience element, my understanding is that many schools at this point, about 50% of the class is not going straight from undergrad or more, depending upon the, on the school. So work experience is becoming a more significant factor in law school admissions than it was, let's say 10 years ago. It's still not as significant as in B school, because the amount of work experience is much more significant when you go to an MBA program than one or two years, even at the, at the law schools that are looking for work experience. But um, again, my main point was that if schools go the waiver route, those people getting the waiver will be the ones that law schools are uncomfortable admitting without the test score. Yeah. Well, that would be, a, I think, that, again, I think the waiver is a fantastic compromise. This is actually the first time I've heard of such a, really? an idea, but I, I think it, it's, it's quite a good compromise. I guess my question is how liberal might schools be in terms of granting the waivers? And then what is the waiver approval process like? I could imagine some schools getting inundated with waivers and then they're basically saying, we don't need you to take the exam. How close is that to an admit at that point? Yeah, I haven't heard any statistics. I haven't, you know, they, they don't release those statistics. Sure. But um I, I know one was at one, I remember being at a conference recently and at that conference, uh, they said the acceptance rates were very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was not the equivalent of an acceptance, a waiver, because there's still all this other stuff, this subjective stuff, if you will. And, uh, you know, the, the LSAT correlates success in B-school academic success, but there are also the non-academic aspects of being a lawyer or admitting somebody into a specific school's community because that's also part of it. So, you know, it's, it's going to be really interesting to, to watch this whole thing unfold in the different contexts. You know, that's, that's my vantage point, of course. Let's pretend that LSAC has made taking a test, any test optional, and I'm, a, I'm an applicant, and my dream school doesn't require a test. Should I jump up and down and skip the hours of studying and the exam itself? Or should I call you, Steve, and say, I still want to take the test? And why should I do that? Yeah, fantastic question. So let's say that tests are no longer required. I would look at the schools that you're, that you're considering. And do those schools still require an exam, even right. if the ABA no longer requires that schools require an exam? My expectation is if you're already at the point where you're listening to a podcast like this or watching a video like this, you're probably applying in the next year or two, I would be guessing, unless you're way, way far ahead of things. Right. If, you're, if, you're in, if you're in middle school, things may change by then. But assuming that, <laughs> assuming that you're applying in the next couple of years, the law schools to which you're applying will probably still require an exam like the LSAT. Some might also require the GRE. So chances are for the next couple of years, you're going to want to take the LSAT if you're reasonably certain that law school is the path for you. If you see the schools to which you're applying saying front and center on their sites, no exams required, then just ask yourself, is this really a, a top tier rigorous school that you would want to attend? Some may, some may not. Also look at your work experience and look at your GPA. 
if your GPA is super high, then maybe that's strong enough. But if your GPA is not as high as you would have liked it to be, then an exam like the LSAT could help you increase your chances significantly. And it's much easier to increase your LSAT score than to increase your entire undergraduate GPA, especially if you're near the end of college. Great, great, uh, great points. Do you think the LSAT currently plays a role in um, scholarships? Oh, significant. Absolutely. A, a significant role, in fact. Yeah. I mean, law schools weigh the LSAT much more heavily than GPA. And the law school admissions is a, is a quite a numbers driven process. So yeah. if your LSAT and your GPA are above the medians of the schools to which you're applying, then law schools will throw money at you because you will help them raise their rankings. And everyone yeah. cares very much about these US news rankings. And so it'll increase the prestige of the school to have you there if you can boost up their numbers. Basically, you're making them look good. Yes, you're making them look good and they will give you discounts on your tuition. In yeah. some cases, a full ride if you can help them out that way. Oh, yeah. Let's say when I apply, let's again, pretend that I'm the applicant, okay? And some of my programs, let's say it's two years down the road, LSAC has passed this optional rule. And so for the next cycle, some programs have gone test optional. And I have the option whether to submit scores or not. That's also, that's also going to be something to, to see. Will the schools require you to submit the score if you took the test for a program, but they themselves are test optional? That's, that's going to be something very interesting to watch. What do you think they'll do in that regard? And I'll get back to my original question in a minute. Well, that's a fantastic question. Yeah. So my understanding cur is that currently, if you have an LSAT score on record from within the past five years, then schools will see it and that it will not have expired. So there is currently something new, kind of like a score choice, where if you are a first time test taker, you can see your score before deciding whether to cancel it. And so this is an artifact of the days when law schools average multiple scores. Now they only take the highest score. And so cancellations doesn't really matter whether you cancel or not, but in a world that is test optional and the schools don't require any kind of LSAT score at all, I could imagine that if your score was below the median of a school to which you were applying, then maybe you would not want them to see it and you would not want it to count. This would require the ABA to do some changes in terms of how it deals with LSAT scores, but it's a really interesting hypothetical. My expectation would be that your LSAT score should be above the median of the school to which you're applying in order for you to want them to consider it. The, um, I recently interviewed the, the Dean of Admissions at UVA Law School. And if I remember correctly what she said, you could, you could submit a GRE score or even a GMAT score at UVA, but if you had taken the LSAT, you were required to send that in also. Exactly. Yeah, that's what right. I was alluding to. Yeah, the idea yeah. that basically the ABA requires schools to submit the highest LSAT score of their matriculating students. So schools in, in partnership with LSAC, they, they get access to those scores kind of whether you want them to or not, as long as you haven't canceled it. Right, right. You didn't have an option. And, and I, I think that would, that, that also is a middle ground where schools can say, well, it's optional, but if you take it for another mm -hmm. school, we're going to see it. We right. want to see it. Um, so that's, that's another possibility. And let's go back to the question I, I in, intended to ask. Well, actually you answered it. If, if you have the option of showing them the score, it should be at or above their median. Now, since this year, a test is still required and probably next year too. And many schools still want the LSAT only. What are your top tips for LSAT study? Yeah, sure. So a couple of them. One is start early. A lot of students only want to devote two to three months to the LSAT in terms of studying for it. But in my experience, it typically takes five to six months to reach your fullest potential, which might seem wow. like a long time, but That's the LSAT's worth it. Like I said, it, it is weighed significantly more than your undergraduate GPA in the admissions process. And this is all very numbers driven in part because of US news rankings. So devote the time to the LSAT that it deserves and you can really increase your chances significantly. Another tip would be to make sure that you're using real official LSAT exams published by LSAC in their law hub system, because that exactly replicates the look and feel 
that you'll have on test day since the LSAT is now online. Okay, great. Do you see any other, I mean, this is a pretty big change on test optionality, but do you see any other significant changes coming down the pike in, in LSAT land or uh, will digesting this one be, be the big news for, for the next couple of years? Well, this is, this is certainly the big news for, for this year, I would say. I can't imagine anything bigger happening <laughs> happening right now. Um, one question I've been getting a lot from folks is, will the LSAT remain online? Because initially, this was maybe going to seem like it was a temporary thing for the LSAT to be online, you know, rewinding two years to the beginning of the pandemic. And they moved it online first in a three-section format, now a current four-section format, which is three scored sections plus one unscored experimental section. And so that appears to be the format for the foreseeable future. So the LSAT is at home, online, administered via ProctorU. And this will be the format for the foreseeable future. LSAC just published the test dates through June 2023. And they're all online at home. And LSAC has modified the language on its website to indicate that the LSAT will remain online for the foreseeable future. Right. And that was actually the topic, I think, of our last podcast, which I'll link to from the show notes at accept.com slash 477. Now, is there anything you would have liked me to ask you that I haven't asked? I think we pretty much covered it, Linda. We, we covered quite a bit. One thing I would just want to remind folks is that the LSAT can be discouraging at time. It is not an easy exam, especially at first, but it is learnable. It can be beat. So please don't equate the LSAT with your self-worth or your intelligence or anything like that. And know that uh, any practice test scores you have, especially prior to having done much studying, definitely do not reflect your ultimate potential on this exam. You can improve significantly. And I would encourage folks, please reach out to me if you need anything at all. I'm happy to help. And I've got a free easy LSAT cheat sheet that folks can access at bit.ly slash easy LSAT. Sounds good. Uh, I think it was a great tip, especially the one about self-worth. That's a really important point to keep in mind. Um, Steve, thank you again for joining me today. And for the last uh, several years, I think about once a year, we've, we've had you on and, and you've always provided wonderful insight into the LSAT. I really appreciate your taking the time to speak with me. Where can listeners and LSAT test takers learn more about your coaching? And you mentioned the free cheat sheet and well, that's a great resource, but um, just in general. Yeah, sure. So folks can find me pretty much anywhere online. I'm very active on all the social media channels, you know, YouTube, podcast, Instagram, even TikTok. And uh, so folks can find me also at just by emailing me help at lsatunplugged.com. I'm happy to help. Sounds good. We'll include links in the show notes at exhibit.com slash 477 to Steve Schwartz's LSAT Unplugged website and some of the other resources that he mentioned, as well as to other related articles and interviews. Listener, thank you too for joining Steve Schwartz and me for our 477th episode. Quick reminder, don't miss the law school admissions quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply and competitive at your target schools. Take the quiz at exhibit.com slash law dash quiz. And a final request, if you find the show worthwhile, please share the good word by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, also known as iTunes. Your doing so helps us spread the news about admission straight talk. You can leave your review at lovethepodcast.com slash A-S-T. Again, that's lovethepodcast.com slash A-S-T. Thank you for your support of the show. It really helps us out. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.